call a day in the life. So how are contractors using this solution today, and what are some of the key benefits of it? Today's presentation is going to focus mainly on services companies, but if you have an interest in learning more and you are a contract manufacturer or product distributor, please feel free to contact us, and we're happy to have a demonstration tailored to your business needs. So what you're looking at right now is the home page for Microsoft Dynamics NAV 2015. So this is the latest version. Uh, Microsoft has continued to enhance the experience that users have with the application. And what you're looking at is one of the standard home pages or role centers, in this case, for a project-based business. I can see key activities that someone would be responsible for performing or overseeing, so things like invoices we need to generate, expense reports that need to be processed by accounting, or timesheet corrections. Each one of these little stacks is a visual cue, in this case of the one expense report that needs to be processed through accounting, and you can see that this one has already been submitted and approved, and accounting needs to go ahead and take that last step in the process to review it uh, and make sure that all charge codes are correct before they process it. You can see when I actually pull up that document, I can see all the details of the projects, uh, the type of expense, whether this expense was paid for um, by the employee or it could be something that was paid for with a company card or a personal item that was company paid. So I can see all those details here, including <clears throat> any type of attachment to that document. And then finally, once I've gone through the, the final approval as an accounting resource, I can go ahead and turn it into a purchase invoice and pay it. And we're going to show you a little bit later the details of how people enter expenses and process those type, um, uh, those type of records. You can also see your Outlook components here, different notifications, and you can set up different grids or charts that you'd like to see. Top right hand corner, I call this the My section because the idea is you can set up your own list of records. So in my demo system, I've probably got 50 different jobs. Here's the four that are on my home page. I can quickly get to any of them by just double clicking the record, and it's going to drop me into the setup screen for where I'm going to set up a new job or project. Over to the right, you can see the details of what, is, uh, what are we tracking for this job. So I can see quickly the contract and funded value, information about revenue, cost, billings, and commitments. Any one of these numbers here, in this case my AR balance of $8,000, whenever I see that number with a line underneath of it, it means I can drill into it. So when I drill into that $8,000, go ahead and pull that screen back up for you. So when I pull up the $8,000, that is the total outstanding AR against this project. And you can see what it's, total, what it's made up of. In addition, if I need to see additional details about one of these records, so in this case, this invoice, number 68, for $1,600, there's only $672 remaining in terms of what is owed. <clears throat> I can actually drill into that amount and see the details of the history behind applications. So whether it's a credit or, in this case, a payment that was made to us, I can see those details right in front of me. And then to look at additional information, I can navigate to take me over to the bank ledger or customer ledger details. So if I wanted to see what bank account we put it in, I could quickly see that it went to our Bank of America account. We deposited $1,000 on the 25th of January. So it really makes it easy for people to find information and tailor that view to the way they'd like to see it. To give you an idea of the breadth of the solution, I'm going to go to the department list. And from this department list, you're going to see all the different modules inside of Dynamics NAV. So everything from financial management, which includes your general ledger, cash management, AP, AR, and fixed assets, sales order processing, purchase order management, warehousing and manufacturing, and like I mentioned earlier, where we're going to spend our time today is around project accounting. So that's the, the project side of the solution. And then there's fully integrated HR, payroll, product contracts. We also integrate with key payroll providers um, because we know a lot of our government contractor clients, they outsource that payroll function you know, to someone like ADP or Paychex, Payroll Networks, Paylocity, et cetera. So this is the first component of the application, the core business software. 
The second piece that Damon talked about is the fully integrated web time and expense system. So this is straight browser-based. This is the place where all employees can go to enter their time, expenses, and also purchase requisitions, and then approve those type of documents. In addition to entering the time, you can also get information related to your PTO balance or request time off. So this is the place that all employees are going to be accessing key information about the system. As Damon mentioned, one of the things that uh, is a big differentiator in the government contractor marketplace from the solutions we deliver as compared to our competitors is related to reporting. So what you're going to see is standard industry reports, and we'll go to inside the system here for this, around what government contractors need to run their business. So everything from a job status report, or some people call it a project status report, which is going to be your project P&L, uh, job revenue summary reports, different timesheet and utilization reports, um, bookings and billings reports. So the key things you need to run your business, each module has its own set of reports. And those can be accessed either from this application or from a browser application for Dynamics NAV. In addition to that, we've also delivered a set of dashboards. So these dashboards are available either through Excel or we're going to show you another way to deliver this experience through SharePoint. And what you're seeing here is information that's coming from both the time entry and accounting system delivered, in this case, through Excel um, with some rich analytics behind it. So everything from a business overview, so giving you a trend of your revenue, profit, and AR, uh, balance sheet with key metrics, income statement, cash flow. For services companies, managing your indirects becomes critical to the business. So this is the place where I can go to get information regarding each of my different pools and where are my rates running. So comparing my actual provisional month over month. So this is showing me a monthly trend. And then we've also got a view that's giving us information regarding current period and year to date where our rates actually running. So key information that contractors need to run their business. In addition, there's a set of project views. So these are really designed for the operations team, giving them the tools to be successful to manage their programs and projects. In this example, you can see key things like your income statement, either by projects or tasks, labor analysis, which is showing us a trend of hours by labor category, your ODC analysis by project and ODC, uh, and then there's a burn rate report, which is going to provide details regarding any particular project that you choose for that project, task, and period combination. We're seeing information regarding this project. So it's going to be details regarding our revenue, all of our operating expenses, including allocation of indirects, what is our net income or loss, and then how much was spent. So it's how much the funding was used in that period. And you can see when I select that particular cell and I go up into my formula bar here, there is no value in there. So it's just showing us for this cube uh, a measure called total spent based on the filters that I set. Then over to the right you can see you know, based on the last, in this case, six months, we're looking at our average burn rate, dividing it by the remaining funding to come up with how many months of funding does the system think we have left. So really giving your operations team and project managers in, predict in particular predictive analytics around how the project is performing and where they are from a funding perspective. So that gives you a general overview of some of the capabilities of the application. Um, before we get into the project side of it, one of the things that I do want to cover is with the NAV 2015 release, one of the things that Microsoft did is enhance the experience with Office 365. So as we're out there talking to government contractors, the thing that we see is more and more companies are moving towards Office 365, which is Microsoft's cloud-based version of Office. One of the things that is incorporated in that experience now is the ability to leverage inside of SharePoint. So whether you're using Office 365 or just SharePoint on-premise, you can actually access key information about NAV. So this is an example that's showing some financial performance via SharePoint. 
So I'm up top, I'm seeing information regarding a high-level view of our income statement. Over to the right, information about a trial balance. And then down below, details regarding receivables, payables, and then some key financial reports. Where this becomes a little bit different is you can actually drill into this information. So if I wanted to find out additional details behind you know, revenue or expenses for a period, I can drill into that. Let me go ahead and refresh my page here. So once I drill into that, it's going to give me that ability to see what are the details behind those expenses. So <clears throat> we'll just give it one second to refresh. And now once we drill into that expense, what it's going to do is it's going to take us inside of Dynamics NAV, and now we're seeing details behind what was on that particular financial statement. Then you can drill further into those expense categories you know, to actually see those details and use Navigate to move across the system. So really enhancing the experience, making it available for many different places for users, um, is really starting to change the way people are accessing information regarding Microsoft Dynamics. So really opening up the world of possibility um, of who can get into the system and really uh, tailoring those views for executives or operations folks so they get just what they want, including NAV information and non-NAV information. So whether you've got other information you want to have in SharePoint, discussion boards, et cetera, you can enhance that experience. <clears throat> so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take you through the day in the life of how a government contractor uses Microsoft Dynamics NAV. But before we do, I think Damon's got a quick poll. And uh, we'd like to get a little insight about, uh, I think we had a question regarding what products, Microsoft products folks on the phone are using today. Yeah. So here's a, a quick little poll for uh, just we want to kind of get a, an idea of what Microsoft products uh, your company is currently using, and, and that would be between Excel, uh, SharePoint, Outlook, and Office 365. As Paul was just talking about with the Office 365, it's uh, kind of a new product from Microsoft. Not new, new, but it's you know a lot of folks are still migrating over to that. Um, from the from the look of the things, everyone's everyone's familiar with Excel. Uh, a lot of folks with with Outlook and. Uh, SharePoint and Office 365. Yeah, so it looks like about 30, 35% of people are using Office 365, you know, 95 plus on Excel, uh, a little less on Outlook, and about 45 on SharePoint. So it seems like, you know, the folks in the phone are already leveraging uh, the Microsoft tools today, which is really uh, one of the big differentiators of what Microsoft provides for their solutions. Okay. All right. Close that poll now. Paul. Great. Thanks, David. Back over to you. <clears throat> All right. So now uh, let's go ahead and get into kind of the meat of the system and talk a little bit about some of those key setups. And I'm going to go ahead and go into a couple different projects and talk about how these projects are set up and some of the details behind them. So what you're looking at here is it was not only showing details regarding the status of the project and you could run key reports against it, but this is also the place where you're going to set up a new project. So in this case, I can see that this particular project, number 1002, the client is the Department of Defense. And anytime you see this little carrot down, it means I'm pulling from a list. So I'm pulling from a list of all my customers. Once I select that customer, it's filling, it's filling in all of the relevant information. In addition, if I have multiple contacts there, I can select a particular contact for that customer. Then I can also identify what type of customer it is. You know, in this case, it's a federal client, but it could be commercial or state and local government. We're using that information for reporting and also for folks on the phone that need to submit their incurred cost submission. It is pulling that data over to your electronic incurred cost submission. Details regarding who's the project manager, what type of project. So in this case, it's a cost plus six fee, but whether it's award fee, incentive fee, um, time material or fixed price projects. You can define what type of contract it is, and we'll talk about at the task level how you can actually override that. What is the period of performance for this particular contract? Does it have an FCA component to it? Do you allow subcontractors? So some key information regarding the setup of the contract. Then we've got information on the posting tab regarding key details um, 
related to revenue and billing, and then accruals related to that project, the departments that are being performed underneath this project, then information about withholding and fee components. So you have a lot of flexibility in terms of handling your cost type contracts. So whether you've got, um, you're using your provisional rate for billing or you've got indirect rates specific to this project, you've got the ability through your billing pool group to define it the way that it was awarded. On the contract tab, I've got information about the contract and paying office related to this particular project. So this is kind of the, the high level data on the project. Then within the work breakdown structure, we get into additional details. So from this WBF um, setup, this is where I'm seeing the details regarding this particular project. So this WBF allows me to have multiple levels. Uh, and then within that hierarchy, I can define if any of the levels are associated with a CLIN or over to the right, you can see my Akron field. I have as an end user the ability to personalize this. I'm going to go ahead and let's move that Akron field over next to the CLIN field. And we'll just say OK. And now what you're going to see is that personalization, once I reopen that form, is going to be set up kind of the way that I'd like to see it. You can also define within any of these WBS elements whether you want to make those codes available for people that enter time people that are in their expenses, both or neither. And then in terms of who can charge to this code, we leverage the concept of membership teams. So you can just assign groups of people that can charge to this. So basically restrict the charging um, based on groups in the organization that can approve. And then you can have approval hierarchies, which are unlimited for both time, expense, and requisition. So really give you that unlimited flexibility of how you manage those different components. In addition, each of these levels, you can define the contract and funded value associated with it. So in this example, you can see that one particular task has $50,000 of contract value, $30,000 is funded. And then you can see this task 001-02, it's got $230K in contract and funded value. If I need to make any modification to it, I can just hit my mod detail screen, and if I enter a new mod, I can say mod number two, and maybe this is as it increased the contract value to uh, an additional 500,000, only 300,000 of it's funded. And then once I say okay here, and then accept that change, you're going to see that the contract and funded value on the overall job has been updated. Um, and then once I go to the work breakdown structure, you're going to see that that same update was made at the detail level here. Anytime you have a document related to this particular record, so if I had an email or I had a file associated with it, I can just drag and drop it against this job card, and now that record would be associated. So an email from your contracting officer uh, related to the approval of the funding, um, or it could be a PDF or Word document, whatever it might be, you can make that available um, to all users. That leverages uh, the SharePoint experience to do that. The other option is you can also link documents, which would be leveraged if you had some type of file folder. You know, so now I've defined this project. I've identified what the structure is in terms of charging, identified funding, any particular funding related to CLIN or Akron, I can identify that. Um, and now the last step would be, you know, people might want to define details regarding budgeting related to this project. So under budgeting and forecasting, you can define who are the people that are going to work on the project, how many hours are they going to charge, then the system is going to calculate based on those direct costs, what is the application of indirects based on your provisional. So I'll see my total burden, um, what is the projected fee or profit on that particular project. This also has import, export to Excel. So I can define the project structure, assign resources, define their budget. The system is going to do, in that budgeting calculation, application of indirects and, and give us a projection of what the profit will be on that particular project. So this is one example of a, 
in this case, cost plus 6C project. Um, and what you're going to see is the setup of other contract types are going to be similar, but there's going to be additional capabilities based on the contract type. So the next one I want to go to is we'll go to a T&M project and talk a little bit about some of the capabilities here. So you can see on this contract type, T&M, you're going to see similar setup on each of the different areas. Uh, the difference when it comes to a T&M contract is that the billing, instead of being based on cost, is based on T&M labor rate. So under resource prices, you're going to see the full history of what our T&M bill rates are. So this is going to be by project. So this is particular two project, 2025, by labor category and effective date. So this is something a little bit different than, than some of the competitors out there. So by giving you the bill rate by labor category and effective date, if you have a multi-year P&M project, you don't need to worry about going back and updating the rates when the date changes. So I can just have them set up once, and the system's going to automatically bill the proper rate based on the timesheet data. You also have the ability to copy in contract pricing. So if you had a scenario where you had a GSA schedule and you wanted to, you're billing this based on your GSA schedule, you can go ahead and select that contract number, what is the effective date, and then pull in the schedule. And then that's going to populate that resource price list for you. You can also take this data, and if I hit Control E, or there's an option here to send this off to Excel, it's going to create a document in Excel, and we'll go ahead and open that up. And what you're going to see inside of Excel is the same information that I had um, inside of NAV. You can see that the date that I sent it across, so in this case, I guess my clock is on Pacific time, uh, so it's 8.27. It gives me a little extra time in the day. Uh, but I can also see the details regarding um, all the labor category codes and what the bill rates are. And then if I want to do some analysis in Excel, I can do that. I'm going to go ahead and enter some additional lines in Excel. And if I want to copy this so I can make those entries in Excel, I'll copy it. And we're going to take it back into NAV. And we're going to go ahead and do an update. All right. And now what you see is that data that we've entered into Excel um, has now been updated inside of NAV. So, I don't need to worry about the fact that it needs to be rekeyed. All the data, it gets entered like it is entered into each cell. Um, so it still validates that the labor category code exists, does the date exist. Um, it's not going to know whether the, the pricing is correct, um, but those key things will be validated. And then you can see when I'm in uh, Excel, if I do a refresh to this, you're going to see that it is going to update the date. And because these have been added, it makes it available. So I, I see, Damon, we've got a couple questions. And I'll, I'll cover a couple of them as we go, um, because this is kind of a good time to stop. And let me just pull up the, so there is a question about uh, if QuickBooks is currently being used for accounting, would this product integrate with it or replace it? And this is a replacement for QuickBooks. So we've done uh, you know, over 100 migrations from QuickBooks. Uh, and we've done probably over 50 from Dell Tech. And then uh, there's a question about the Service Contract Act, but not Davis-Bacon. Uh, we do support Davis-Bacon. One of the things that uh, I didn't talk about was that the system actually gives you the ability to hide and show fields. So not every field is shown on my uh, data entry form. So what you're able to do is actually decide what fields are hidden or shown by default. So on each one of these pages, you have that ability on the tab to decide what information is shown or hidden. So uh, DBA contracts are also incorporated. Uh, I just have my SBA contract shown. So to, to finish up the T&M contract, and we'll, we'll cover more questions during uh, each break. Uh, but so I first defined what my T&M bill rates are. Then I need to define what are the people that are charging under particular labor categories. So because individuals in the company might not uh, charge under the same labor category code on every project, you're able to define what the defaults are for individuals on this project. So in this example, 
I can see that uh, Andrew Simmons is going to be a project manager on his project. His corporate labor category code might be senior consultant, but by doing this, it's going to default it for his or her timesheet. Uh, and then also, based on the labor category code that they're working under, it's going to know the proper bill rate. So if I filter uh, my list, you can see that because Andrew is a project manager, uh, the bill rate for him currently is going to be $240 an hour. And then if I go over to the right, I could see who are the folks that are PMs in this project. So in this case, Andrew and Kevin are PMs for that project. So it really makes it easy to enter data and also kind of filter things on the fly as a user. So that's a little bit about uh, setting up of the project. Uh, I won't go through all the types, you know, but the system is also supporting uh, firm fixed price. You can also define funding limits. So if you have caps on your funding, uh, you're able to support that whole effort. So whether you've got uh, the idea of uh, capping, you, know, you got a firm fixed price level of effort where you can only charge so many hours to a labor category code in the period, you can support that effort. Uh, along with you can have caps on your rate. So really trying to support uh, many different requirements related to contracts giving you the flexibility to do that while making sure that you stay compliant with federal requirements. All right, so that's the first key step is setting up the project. Now let's get a little bit into the entry of time and expenses and then also approval of those type of documents. Sure. And <clears throat> excuse me, I just want to, there, there was a question that came up and I just want to clarify real quick. Paul, uh, when we were talking about Office 365, that is not a required software to have Correct. to use Dynamics NAD. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not required. You know, the, when we talk about the integration, any list or ledger, you can send it off to Excel. The, the thing that has changed is Microsoft has made it available to work with Office 365. So it's always worked with the base Office products. You know, the Office 365 is kind of this... Uh, you know, a new product that Microsoft got out there, and it all still works with that. Right. And we have a lot of questions coming in, and again, we'll try to get to those as we go along. But yes, absolutely. Not, we'll cover those. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. So before I go over to time and expense, one of the things I do want to cover is I talked a little bit about filtering, and one of the things that you can do is from your list of projects, you can do several different things. I can set filters. Um, I can also actually take data from a list and turn it into a chart. Uh, and if you create something that you like, you can actually save it. So for instance, say I'm looking at all projects that are, um, let's look at all of our TNM projects. So let's go ahead and filter that. So if I have a list of my TNM projects, I can actually save those. And then what happens is it becomes a view over to the right. So I can take this actual setup, save it, and then put it as a view to the right. And the reason why I mentioned that is I created one earlier today uh, just to show some of the ability to create views inside of it. So what I did is I created a view which was actually looking at the type of contracts compared to what agencies, or I shouldn't say agencies, but type of clients, so commercial or federal, state, local government. Uh, and then I can actually take that view and save it, and now I can quickly get to it. So on my jobs, I've got all jobs that are completed, all jobs that are not assigned to anybody in terms of the project manager, and then all jobs that are planned and quoted. So that filter idea that we showed earlier, you can actually create new lists from those filters. So you, you set that filter, you like it, I can actually save it, and that becomes a standard view. All right, so let me go ahead and uh, let's go off to the time and expense entry system, talk a little bit about time and expense entry. So on the web t &E side, one of the things to mention is the system has configuration options for periods. So in my demo system here, I've got a weekly timesheet. The system supports weekly, biweekly, semi-monthly, monthly. We've got clients that have eight-day timesheets. So that was uh, one I just learned about probably about four years ago. Um, but there's a lot of variations depending on you know how you want to capture time. You can also have different timesheet periods within the same company. The product also supports multiple companies and all the complexities around that. 
you have the ability to identify favorites. So if you have a list of projects that you charge to every month, you can define those favorites. You know, I can, I can select. Uh, and I'm only seeing the projects that I'm assigned to. You know, so in this case, this project number 57 is one of the standard projects that I have. I can select the project, the WBS that I typically charge to. It fills in my labor category code to me for me. I can add that to the list. So I can go ahead and pick a couple different projects that I charge to every period. Once I select that list, it's able to pull that list into my uh, time entry system every month. So I'm going to go ahead and just save those favorites. And then next week in my timesheet, when I open it up, all those favorites will be in there for me. If I needed to just add a line on the fly, uh, well, it looks like I, I've, already, uh, I've already submitted this timesheet. So let's go ahead and add a new timesheet. So I can create a new timesheet uh, and then go ahead and we'll make some entries to this. So if I needed to enter my hours for Monday, enter my hours for Monday. If I need to make a comment, I can comment that in there. And we'll enter some hours for Tuesday. Same idea in terms of comments. So I'm just going to go to each day, enter my hours, save it, and that's going to be the process I go through each day. Once I've completed the timesheet, I would go ahead and submit it. This submission process would trigger the workflow approval um, and the workflow approval can be line level where project managers approve timesheets or you could have, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a multi-level hierarchy in terms of that timesheet approval. The system supports um, regular notifications. So on a daily basis you can send notifications to their employees, to your employees. So if they didn't enter time yesterday, uh, they can get notified that the time needs to be entered. Uh, it also has controls in place to prevent things like time entry in advance on direct charge codes. And if I make a change to a previously saved cell, the system's going to require that I put a comment in there. So from a DCA compliance perspective, it has those key things in there to make sure that you're compliant. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about related to timesheets is regarding your PTO balance. So if I need to look up my PTO balance, I can just click my PTO button. In this case, this individual doesn't have a current balance, but it's going to show your current PTO balance. If you need to request time off, you would just go to the PTO request function, and this would be the place that you're going to go in and ask for the time off related to uh, any PTO that you need. <clears throat> if someone needs to enter time on behalf of another user, they can use the enter on behalf of function, and then the user still needs to submit the time, um, but it's a way for uh, folks that maybe don't have access to a timesheet um, or maybe the CEO uh, doesn't like to get into the timesheet, the admin staff could actually enter the time on behalf of that individual. In terms of expense entry, uh, you can also go ahead and enter expense reports. So we'll go ahead and we'll just quick, quickly create an expense report and show you a little bit regarding that. So we'll just say we traveled from the 16th and maybe it was through the 19th. Description of the travel, so it's been so cold here that maybe we should uh, travel to uh, uh, Florida, <laughs> anywhere warmer. Um, and that's going to create my expense report for me. And then I can go ahead and add new lines to that expense report. And for any particular date, uh, what job that it's for. And again, I only see the jobs that I'm assigned to, so I'm not going to see all jobs. Uh, and then I'm going to choose the expense category. So these expense categories are defined um, by the company. So you're going to define your expense categories. You can see they're codes. They're not account numbers. And what this allows you to do is actually map these codes to GL accounts inside the system. So the user doesn't need to know what the GL account is. They just choose the code that makes logical sense to them. And once they select it, they can go ahead and save it, and then that's going to be on their expense report. So in this case, I, you know, maybe I needed to um, buy a laptop. So I chose my materials code. I can identify if this expense here, um, whether it was paid for by me or I used the company card. And I'm just going to go ahead and say that uh, it was a laptop that I purchased. And then what was the amount for that expense? And maybe that was $1,000. And then I'm going to go ahead and save that. 
over my right, we'll save it. And that's going to be the process I go through. And then if I had some type of attachment, I can go out and grab that attachment, and we're just going to drag and drop it uh, against this section here. So uh, we'll just grab a document from our desktop. We'll add it on, and now that attachment is associated um, with the particular record. So really quick to enter expenses uh, as an end user. Once I complete that process, I can go ahead, we'll save that attachment that I entered, and then we'll go ahead and submit it. And then it's going to kick off the approval process for someone to review and approve that expense report. In this case, because that uh, requisition was for a laptop, I could also, I should say the expense report was for a laptop, I could have gone through the requisition process to actually get approval before I spent the money. Um, so there's both uh, expense reports and requisitions, and there's approval function for all document types. Same idea in terms of entering on behalf of, and then there's a per diem function uh, that allows you to, and I'll just create a new expense report and just give you a little sense for uh, the per diem process. But that per diem wizard allows you to actually uh, use the per diem elements uh, to record an expense report. So the per diem process is going to allow someone to select where they traveled, uh, same idea of when they traveled, uh, and then it's going to show the user what is the cap for lodging, and then you're going to add under your actual lodging and tax. System's going to handle uh, any type of overage to that. It handles the 75% first day and last day, um, and any types of meals and incidentals that you didn't take. So for instance, if breakfast was included within the hotel, you can uncheck that component. So really makes it easy for an end user to enter that data. They don't have to go to the GSA website to do it. Um, it's going to all be inside the system for them. So as users are entering time and expense, uh, a couple things that are unique about what we do is, one, the reporting solution. We talked earlier about that whole data cube technology. Every night, it's actually pulling in information regarding time that's been entered. We call it that's an, a committed cost so uh, or obligated cost. So cost that has been entered against the project that hasn't been approved yet we're actually showing it inside of our data cube. So once people have entered the time uh, for accounting to process it, they're going to go into the time journal. So we'll go ahead and go to our time journal. And this is the place where we're going to manage people's timesheets. The first thing I'm going to do is run the missing time report. And what this is going to do is this is going to give us visibility of everyone that has an entered time. Maybe they haven't had their time approved yet. Uh, and then you're going to go and chase those folks down and get them to go through that process. Once they've completed that um, and everybody has entered time, then you're going to import the timesheet. So this import timesheet function is going to bring all the time inside the accounting system, all the approved time, and it's going to create basically the timesheet journal for you. And then from there, we're going to calculate the labor distribution. And what that will do is it will calculate the per hour cost uh, for each one of these employees. We're going to run a time journal summary report, and this time journal summary report is going to give us the details of what's going to happen when we post this. So when I run labor distribution, you'll see the amounts get updated, uh, and we're going to see for each person if they're salaried, the system supports both effective rate, standard rate, and then different methods of dilution. And then for hourly people, it's just going to do the calculation based on your hourly rate. We're going to see what's going to be the impact on the project side. So how many hours and dollars will be charged to project. Same idea on the GL summary. So this is a system that posts in real time. It's not a batch-based system. So when I make that posting, it's going to hit all those ledgers um, at the same time. So this kind of leads us into the next question, Damon. I think we want to get a little idea of the folks on the phone, uh, what systems are they using? So we can get an idea if they're using, uh, whether it be QuickBooks or uh, one of the Dell Tech products, and we can get a little sense for um, the folks that are on the phone today. Yeah, I've gone ahead and uh, uh, put up the, the poll. So uh, for the current, uh, yeah, the current accounting system that your company is uh, is using, uh, we have the choices here: the QuickBooks, Dell Tech, uh, Microsoft Dynamics. 
uh, Procast or, or perhaps something else. Um, and we had some some questions. Um, well, the QuickBooks looks like a lot of folks are on the QuickBooks there. Okay. Um, and obviously, we had that question earlier about whether this was um, something that integrated with QuickBooks. Yep. Uh, but it is completely separate. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like the file numbers come in. We've got about a little over 40% on QuickBooks, a little over 30 on Dell Tech. Uh, we've got some Microsoft Dynamics users and a few others. Um, so that's good. Good to know some key information. And I think um, before we go to the next step, when you think about the differences, I think related to QuickBooks, you know, this is a fully integrated enterprise system uh, that has the controls and the ability to manage cost-type contracts and more complex uh, business requirements. Uh, as it compares to Dell Tech, I think what you're going to see is uh, the ease of use, integration with the Microsoft suite, uh, reporting overall are key advantages for companies that we've moved off of Dell Tech. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go for it. Yeah, let's, thanks, Damon. So once you've gone through to process the labor, like I mentioned earlier, there's a payroll system inside of NAV, but we've also got integration with payroll providers. So ADP, Paychex, payroll networks, etc. And then once I complete this, I can go ahead and post this, and now that time is going to be against those different sub-ledgers and then available for billing. So that takes us to the next step, uh, which is the billing process. And uh, let me go ahead and we'll go over to uh, one of our projects to talk a little bit about how we're going to uh, generate an invoice. So the process to generate invoices, you run the create invoice function. And what you're going to do here is you're going to go ahead and identify the project that you're running it for. Let me make it a little bigger so you can see the whole screen. The project we're going to, we're going to run it for, the billing group, um, what is the period we're going to run it for, uh, this whole idea of final rate, that's if you've got a cost type contract. So instead of using your provisional rate, once you get the final rate from the government, there's also the ability to schedule these. So it's a new thing with uh, Dynamics NAV 2015 is this whole concept of scheduling the report. So instead of running it during work hours, I'm going to schedule all of my invoices to run after hours. And then once I schedule them, what's going to happen is it creates uh, what's called an invoice proposal or like a pre-invoice that a user is going to review before they go ahead and process it. So I'll go ahead and pull one of them up. Uh, and then what's going to happen from here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this. So we'll print the invoice off. I can decide how do I want to group the invoice. So category, category, group, and labor type, the idea here is our different category groups are things like, you know, we've got different expense categories and labor categories. If I do category group and labor type, that means it's going to split out our subcontract labor from our direct labor. Uh, do I want to print the labor by resource or labor category code? Do I want to show inception of date or do some type of roll-up of the invoice, subtotal it by task? So we've got a bunch of different options. Once you decide for the project how you want to print it, you would just save it. So I'd save that option of how I want to print it, and it's going to print it out that same way each time. You know, so now when I see the details of the invoice, um, it's going to show information about the period of performance, uh, the billing period, who is the customer. Then you can also see some key information about this project. So the contract number, fund value, how much funded fee was there, how much funding remaining after this invoice. <clears throat> and then we see details. Uh, in this case, I show it broken out by task. So for this first task of requirements, I've got my direct labor section. I've got two employees that charged in the current period and what their inception of date amounts were. I've also got a subcontractor that worked in a prior period. Uh, the application of our indirect. So in this demo example, I've got a 23% fringe rate, 25% uh, company, 50% client site, 100% GNA rate, uh, and then what is the fee on that? And then you're going to see for the other task uh, the same detail. And then on page two, uh, we're going to see the total for that invoice. So it'll including any type of withholding for it. All these reports, or all these invoices are just reports, and you can export them out to Excel, PDF, or Word. So once 
accounting has reviewed it, there's an approval process. So I can actually send the approval off, and this leverages SharePoint, where I'm going to send the approval off to a PM to review it, and they can approve or reject that particular invoice. If you don't use SharePoint, we can use the internal approval uh, inside of Dynamics NAB for that. So once it's been approved, what's going to happen is the status will move from a pending approval status to a release status, and then accounting can go ahead and post that document. Once the document's been posted, what you'll see is it's going to move from this invoice proposal step to a posted invoice, which is your historical document. And what you're able to do is you can actually go in and reprint any of these invoices at any time. So here's the list of all the invoices we've sent to the customer. If I wanted to reprint it, I would just go back into it, and we could print this off again uh, just like we did the original time. So you'll see the same details that you did when you sent it out to the customer. You can also send that invoice out to the customer uh, via PDF inside of Dynamics NAV. Uh, and then we also have the ability to print out uh, your invoices on standard government forms. So the 1034, the 1035, the DD250, you can print those documents out and then send them off to your customer. So that kind of takes you through that workflow from setting up the project, uh, collecting time and expenses, and then the billing process. Uh, I want to cover a couple other things for folks, and I want to make sure that we leave enough time for questions. And one of the things that I want to show is uh, you know, we entered, oops, we entered an expense report earlier, and let's go ahead and let's show you that that expense report uh, actually came into the system. Uh, so there's nothing, once that gets submitted, uh, you can see that here's the submitted document, here's the one that's in draft mode. So the one that was submitted hasn't been approved yet, but you can see that it has been submitted, and this was a $1,000 laptop, and then I could actually pull up those attachments uh, that would be available to me. So. You know, the key thing is the automation, uh, not having to re-enter data, and all the information that you need uh, to make sure that things are processed correctly. So I also, uh, because the invoice we were showing was a cost type invoice, I want to show the setup of your indirect rates because that is, <clears throat> when you think about uh, something that's a big differentiator from QuickBooks and a key component of the system, uh, it's regarding managing your indirect rates. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing the details of how your rates are set up, and there's four steps to the process. So step one is to define your rate structure. So in this example, I've got a fringe, a two overhead, and a G&A pool. You can have an unlimited number of pools. So there's no restriction on the number of pools. Um, and this is also the place where you're going to have both your final and intermediate pools. Each one of these pools, once it's defined, there's three steps in terms of the setup. So step one is to define what's in your pool and what's in your base. So in this overhead company site pool, uh, what is in my pool is a range of overhead accounts. So these accounts are just defined within um, this account set group. So if we go into our uh, list of what are our overhead accounts. We'll just look at the details of that. You can see it's all accounts from 7,000 through account number 7,700. So I entered that one time, and then I can use that in any area throughout the system. Same idea in terms of what's in our base. So in this case, our base is our direct labor with fringe applied. And also what department it's associated with. So this would be the range of departments in this case, our company site um, department. Uh, we'll go ahead and do the same thing there. And we'll look at the list of what's in our company site. In this case, it looks like it's just one department. But you could have you know, a range of departments, or you can have a list of departments that are in that particular range. The next step is, once you define what's, what's the calculation in terms of your pool and base, you're defining that allocation. So within the allocation, this is telling the system, once I've accumulated these costs, what's going to happen to them? So the cost could get accumulated, and then those costs could actually be allocated into another pool to be later picked up. Or in this case, once I've accumulated these costs, I'm actually allocating them out to all projects for the 
the departments that were listed um, in that department set. So in this case, I'm doing it at both an actual, and then we've also got a provisional allocation out to projects. So the system is doing it both to the GL side and the project side. And then the last step is to define uh, what is the provisional rate that we're using for billing. So in this example, you can see, and it's as of date, so as of a certain date, what is the provisional rate for billing? And then finally, what is the, you know, your final rate or actual rate? So once the government does your final audit, you can plug in that final rate. The system's going to use that for allocations and billings. So that kind of gives you guys, uh, the folks on the call, an idea of overall capabilities of the system. So today was not meant to get into all detail. So today is really um, an opportunity for us to introduce you to Dynamics NAV uh, and why really so many companies are migrating to it. So we've had incredible growth um, really over the last 10 years, but it's really sped up recently. And we feel it's because of Microsoft's key investments that are differentiating it along with the improvements that we've made to reporting. So, Damon, that leaves us uh, just a couple minutes for a few questions. Yeah, we so, actually have uh, a lot of questions that came in. Okay. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to all of them. Um, there are quite a few. And all right. So why, why don't I do this? We're going to start with. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll go ahead and uh, let me pull up the list, and we'll cover as many as we can. Uh, and like Damon mentioned, if we end up in a situation where we don't cover your question, uh, we will reach out to you directly to add answer it for you. So, uh, all right, here's a question here that talks about uh, what are the primary features you added to NAV to handle the unique requirements of government contractors who need to demonstrate DCA compliance? So, as folks on the phone that have worked with the federal government know, it's not just about the system, it's also, you know, it's like you've got documented processes and you follow those processes. Um, but the things that we've done is everything around uh, improving the allocation process so it meets the unique needs of a government contractor. Uh, there's other areas around reporting. Uh, we've incorporated key reports that the government looks for. Uh, and then in terms of segregation of costs, so segregating direct from indirect, allowable from unallowable, there's a whole methodology around that. Um, so that along with uh, some of the key things in the timesheet system uh, that we mentioned earlier, so stuff uh, regarding time entry in advance and tracking all the changes inside the system. So uh, for that individual, you know, obviously it, it brings your name through. We'll send you some details regarding that. The other thing to mention is our operations team here, so within our organization, we've got two former DCA auditors that are actually part of the implement, implementation team. So not only is DCA compliance baked into the system, but we've got a lot of experience in terms of how you manage it. Um, yeah, I think we have time for one more, Paul, and I think this is one that came <coughs> up a couple of times, so I'm going to throw it to you. Okay. Uh, as far as what size company is this product best suited for in terms of revenue employees? Okay. And can a company grow into it? Sure. All right. So, and, and again, there's a bunch of questions on here. So I, I want to answer one other one, too. Okay. But to answer that question, uh, really, this is one of the major differences, is that this system has a wide scale of users. So, and, and I'll just talk to our user base. We've got clients that are as small as, I would say, you know, 10 million in revenue, up to we've got clients that are a billion dollars in revenue. So, a very wide range of customers using the system. And I would just add a little commentary to it. The reason is, from a pricing perspective, it's priced in a way that it, I'll say it's affordable for you know, emerging companies. Uh, and also it has the look and feel and ease of use that emerging companies need. And then it's got advanced capabilities that the larger companies need. So that's one of the reasons why we went to this whole idea of configured um, types in terms of contracts. So. We've seen the government go to more and more complex contract types where they're combining things, so hybrid contracts. So there's configuration based to manage those more complex requirements. So uh, hopefully that helps to answer the question. But really, a company can grow into it. We've had clients that started out as a you know 12 to 15 million dollar business and one that grew to uh, 300 million before they sold the business. 
um, and they were able to manage that growth all inside of NAV. Uh, and we've got one more minute, Paul. Do okay. you have one more question you want to cover? Yeah, so uh, the last question I want to cover was there was a question regarding the software assumes PC-based environment. Do you have a complete web-based solution? And NAV does allow you to run, we'll say, in three different client modes. So it can be a client server, which you would call PC-based. Uh, you can leverage SharePoint as the front end. Or Microsoft just has a straight browser option. So earlier when we were on, um, you guys remember in this Office 365 view, there is, uh, I'll go ahead and open this up, there is a Dynamics Nav client. It doesn't need to be on Office 365. It can just be a straight browser. It's going to be a very similar experience uh, to the one that's the client base. So I think we ran over just a few seconds. We did. But okay. we didn't want to rush things. We do. We will follow up with each of you that asked the question uh, that we weren't able to answer live. But we truly appreciate your time uh, in considering Microsoft Dynamics NAV. Very exciting time for government contractors that are converting to it because we know it is a challenging time for the industry. We feel like we've got a cost-effective solution that can scale with your business. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.